Laura Schwartz here and welcome to this Facebook Live session. On this session, I want to address a whole bunch of questions I had this week regarding um, saxophone reeds, uh, neck straps, I guess choices of instrument and stuff like that, all those types of things. So I'm Donna Schwartz from DonnaSchwartzMusic.com. I'm from Los Angeles, but originally I'm a New Yorker. I've lived all my life in New York and recently moved out to LA to enjoy the much better weather, especially during the winter time. Um, you can check out my website at DonnaSchwartzMusic.com. Lots of practical tips and solutions to help you with your music-related issues, whether it's having uh, difficulty playing altissimo notes, whether it's getting a good tone, a good sound on your instrument for both saxophones and brass, because I also play trumpet as well, and also dealing with performance anxiety and other types of uh, music issues. Hey, Carlos. Okay, so the first question I had was this. I write so small, I don't know how I could read this stuff. <laughs> People always laugh at me when I do that. Okay, uh, one question I had was, if your hands are too small, like mine, <laughs> why not start on the soprano sax? Um, I used to get that question a lot when I taught public school in New York for, um, for a long time. And, you know, kids would see Kenny G playing or Dave Cos or, or uh, you know, uh, any of those guys out there that are playing soprano sax to be like, oh, that's awesome. I want to play that. It's small. I can do it. Here's the thing, though. Usually the smaller the instrument, number one, the more resistance. Number two, it's usually harder to play. <laughs> hey, Carlos. Um, it's usually harder to play. Let's take the example of a trumpet and a piccolo trumpet. Now, you try to start on a piccolo trumpet and you're going to pop an eyeball trying, trying to get a sound out of that thing. It's very difficult. There's a lot of resistance in the horn, which means that you have to have a really strongly developed embouchure setting and really, really incredibly good breath support to bypass that resistance. Same holds true with a flute and a piccolo. Same holds true with a saxophone, whether it's alto or tenor, and a soprano saxophone. Now, here's the thing, too. You find that um, in terms of intonation, it's much more difficult to have, get those smaller instruments in tune. It's just a quirky little thing, especially the soprano sax. If you're not developed here, meaning you know you have a good solid embouchure um, and you really understand how to use your oral cavity to adjust to get notes and all that kind of stuff, if that's not developed yet, don't try the soprano sax, okay? Not yet. You just, you gotta develop this, really get that breath support going, and you really have to have a good uh, concept of pitch of tone and know you know if you're in or out of tune okay so I would not recommend for beginners to start at soprano sax doesn't matter your hand size I got small hands and I play the tenor um, when I was teaching in public schools I would have my kids audition to play saxophones what I'd have them do is come into the room and we're talking third graders actually I'd have them come into the room those that were in, interested in saxophone uh, they'd sit down, I'd put a neck strap on, on them, I'd put the saxophone on them, and they, what they'd have to do is be able to reach around the, uh, the palm keys with the left hand and the right hand side keys, not touching them and being able to move the, uh, the other keys, wiggle their fingers and move the other keys, hold up the saxophone in a good posture for about two minutes or so. Why two minutes or three minutes? You're practicing, you're holding it up that long. Why did I do that? Because if you can't get your fingers wrapped around those keys without pressing them down, you're going to squeak, squawk, and whatever you're going to do, you're not going to sound good, and there's no point, you know, you're going to quit, and nobody wants you to quit an instrument. So if your hands are too small, I uh, strongly suggest you to start on the clarinet. It's a great instrument, and it's great to start with because if you can play the clarinet really well, the saxophone's going to come just that much easier. It really will. Yes, you're going to have to make adjustments with some of the fingerings and stuff and adjustments with your embouchure, but it's just going to come that much quicker. Some of the greatest players started on clarinet. A lot of guys that play a lot of gigs around started on clarinet. They double on clarinet. Okay, so I hope that answered that question. Um, someone asked, um, you don't want to bite so much on the top part of the mouthpiece. And he writes, how high should the saxophone be to not put so much uh, pressure on the top or on the bottom of the mouthpiece? Well, the, the thing is this. You want, to, you want to have a neck strap that's comfortable, 
that's not providing, that's not putting too much stress on the back of your neck, and you want to bring the instrument to you, you don't go to the instrument. I don't care what instrument you play. If you're going to the instrument, you're going to have bad posture. You're not going to be able to take a full breath. You're also going to cause some other types of problems with, um, well, with your tone and everything else. So bring the instrument to you. Now, in terms of neck straps, I use the Van Doren FNH 100 harness. I think this is awesome. It totally takes the weight off the horn. Now, I'm, I'm a shorter person, and I uh, was exposed to this to this neck strap from one of my student teachers a few years ago. He had, and this is a guy that's like six foot three and you know <laughs> much bigger than me, and he showed me this thing, and he strapped a barry onto this neck strap. I, did, I barely felt the weight of the horn. I really did. So that sold me right then and there. So a really good neck strap is really important. Um, other neck straps that people use, this is the sax holder. Yes, it looks like an exoskeleton. <laughs> um, this is great also, too. I tend to use this um, sometimes on my alto as well. Um, this also takes the weight of the horn off. It's just for me, I have very narrow shoulders, so um, I find that you know, I can't lean down to get water while the saxophone's attached. I got to be careful with that. They did make adjustments to this so that it hooks in and so that it won't necessarily fall off, but that, um, it still doesn't work for me, unfortunately. That's just me though. I hear other people using other types of neck straps like, um, Just Joe's gel strap. I use that for a little bit too. Neotech. Those are, those are good also. Um, the thing with the Neotech though, it's great for beginners, but the thing is they do, um, they take a lot of the weight off but they tend to bounce a little bit. So you've got to be, you know, you got to be really careful with that. So uh, you want to bring the saxophone up high enough. Let me just get my saxophone together here. You want to bring the instrument to you. So you don't want to be down here like that. You want to take your right thumb and push the instrument away from you so that the mouthpiece comes to you. Okay, and you don't, the person said, you know, how do you avoid biting down so much on the top of the mouthpiece? Well, bringing the instrument to you is the first thing. But also thinking about your lip position, okay? You don't need to have a death grip on the mouthpiece. In fact, you shouldn't. You're going to um, stilt the sound, okay? So just think about forming an F or a V, put it in. <laughs> I just feel my, my teeth just resting on there. All right, just resting. It's just, um, it's just a question of probably your posture and whether you're bringing the horn to you and also probably the quality of your neck strap. Okay, so I hope that that helps answer that particular question. Okay, another one. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, okay, this was a good one. This is how I, I normally start most of my beginners. Um, notes on the mouthpiece okay if you're one of the things that you want to be able to do is produce a sound on the mouthpiece and you know as a brass player too we don't just start by picking up the trumpet and blowing what we do we first get our air going breathing exercises as we should do with any wind instrument but what we also do is um we play a lot on the mouthpiece okay and then we play on the horn same thing with the saxophone you're a little bit limited on a woodwind mouthpiece compared to a brass mouthpiece because for brass players, it's the it's all here. It's lips, you know, tongue, air, all that kind of thing. Here we have a reed to deal with. So you want to try to get as close to the following pitches on your mouthpiece as possible. Um, if you're, well, let me say the pitches first. This is a tenor mouthpiece, so I would shoot for a concert G. So I'm gonna use my handy dandy old tuner That's concert G. That's the pitch. So you want to get close to that pitch. Try to get it in tune. And then eventually do some bends. And then you could also eventually do our arpeggios and such. Try 
trying to work out those squeaks. Um, on an alto mouthpiece, you're shooting for concert A. So I'll just use this goose here. And you're doing the same thing. You're doing some bends. You're uh, doing some arpeggio exercises. But when you're first starting out, just get one pitch. Make it nice and solid. You got to take a deep breath. You need a lot of breath support for that. Um, try to get it as close to being in tune as possible. You notice that I played the pitch. Um, it, this is a tuner, so it played the pitch for me or a keyboard or whatever. Uh, you play the pitch. You notice I sang it. Okay. You're not hearing something unless you could sing it. So I sang it and then I played it on the mouthpiece. Now, um, I found, especially working with a lot of beginners, especially uh, beginners when they first had that stock mouthpiece, you know, not every stock mouthpiece, they should, but not every stock mouthpiece is made for the horn that they're, you know, they made. And uh, unfortunately, you know, these kids are trying to, to imitate some of these pitches and they're not, it's like all over the place. It's way too high, it's screechy, all that kind of thing. So I tend to think that those mouthpieces are not very good for them. And if that's happening to you, you may look into the next step up. Myers are awesome mouthpieces. A lot of people go with the Selmer C Stars. Yamaha, Yamaha makes great stock mouthpieces. The uh, 4C is the one that usually comes with whatever horn you're getting. You know, they have 4C, 5C, 6, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you've got a stock mouthpiece and you're finding that you're not able to match those particular pitches, get the uh, stock, those stock mouthpieces, try them out and see if you can get those pitches and I think it's going to work for you really well. Hey, by the way, let me just say uh, to plug, please share this. If you're on with me live right now, please share this. Let other people know. Come on, say hi. Okay. If you have any questions, please type them in, in the comments box. Um, I want to try to get to them today, although I have a bunch here, but I do want to get to them today. Um, if you're watching this on the replay, hey, share it as well. But also check out my website, donnaschwartzmusic.com. If you subscribe to my weekly newsletter, which gives you weekly tips and uh, other advice and all that other kind of thing, right now you can get your free video lesson, three tips to fatten up your sound on the saxophone. So check out my website and please share this replay or the live video right now. Okay, the other part of that question, um, it, was a really, it was a really good question. It, it actually reminded me of, I haven't addressed this before, but um, after you play the mouthpiece, you also want to play the mouthpiece neck. Now you're kind of limited. This really limits you, again, more than just a regular mouthpiece. So on an alto mouthpiece neck, you're getting the concert A flat pitch. On a tenor mouthpiece neck, it's concert E. All right, so here's, um, let's see if I can get this down. Actually, I have to go much lower. It's E, E4, actually. Now, if this is the interesting thing that I found, aside from some of the kids that were having difficulty matching the mouthpiece pitch, um, some people, some kids, some beginners couldn't get even close with the mouthpiece neck pitch. And I thought that was really interesting. And I think what it is is that that mouthpiece is just not the right mouthpiece for the horn or maybe for the player. And I found with some students, when we changed mouthpieces, they nailed the pitch. So that's another thing to think about too. If you find you're kind of struggling with your sound a little bit, um, check those things. Check to make sure that you can get as, you know, as close as you can to those mouthpiece pitches I mentioned. Also make sure that you're able to produce a concert E on the tenor or a concert A flat on the uh, alto mouthpiece neck. And if you're nowhere near there, if you're insanely sharp and you can't adjust it down or really flat and you can't adjust it, and I'm not just talking, you know, on the neck, neck cork, I'm talking just, you know, in your oral cavity, something to think about. It's something to think about in terms of, um, you know, your mouthpieces and stuff like that. So I hope that that helped you because that, that's really, uh, that's really important too. You know, who wants to struggle when they're, uh, you know, when you're playing, you know what I mean? Okay, so uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, oh, this was a really good question too. What in your sound or resistance in your playing makes you decide if a read is too hard? Okay, um, here's the thing. When you, 
when you're playing, you know, you want to have, obviously you want to have fun when you're playing, but you want everything to be efficient, meaning that you don't want to be, have like a tree trunk, <laughs> blowing through a tree trunk, you know, on your mouthpiece. You don't want cane that's so stiff that um, you're struggling just to get any note. You, you want something that's going to respond right away, you know, throughout the registers of the horn. You want something that also responds in terms of dynamics, volume, soft and loud. If you find that you could only play loud um, and you can't play soft, the reed may be too hard. It may not be the right strength for you, okay? Um, if you're finding that your tone is um, uh, edgy, like nails on a chalkboard, for those of you that remember what a chalkboard is, <laughs> if your tone is like really edgy, uh, that reed may be too soft, okay? Or maybe not even balanced, too. Um, so, you know, in terms of resistance of your playing, you want, you, uh, you want it efficient. You want to be able to blow and it just comes out. Now, again, you're listening, you're listening to the sound in your head and you're wanting, you're, um, doing whatever you can to make it come out the bell. What you can do is record yourself and see if it's matching what you hear up here. Because by the way, when you're playing, you know, I'm hearing some, one thing, but what's coming out the bell my head's, my ears aren't at the bell. My ears are here. So I really recommend that you record what you're doing to really hear what you sound like. Um, because we don't hear that. And I know from playing trumpet, and uh, Vince Panzarelli used to tell us to me all the time, you know, you're playing, there's also compression building up. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's uh, limiting your hearing also. So that's why you really have to rely on your tonal concept and what you want to say more so than what's coming out the bell. That's really important because if your head's out the at the bell, you're gonna get messed up. Okay. Um, so uh, in terms of the reeds and stuff like that, the resistance. You know, if again, you don't want too much resistance because why make it so much harder for yourself? You know, you may be thinking, oh well, the more resistance, it's gonna give me more power. Well, how about more breath support or more embouchure support? Okay, that's just the way I look at it from there. Now another thing to think about too. Are your reeds balanced? It may not be the strength of your reed that's causing the problem. It may not be that it's not balanced. There's some awesome, awesome tools out there. And thanks to a bunch of my, uh, you know, members on my website for letting me know about this. It's the ATG system, the Ridenour system. You could find this, just do a Google search, Ridenour, R-I-D-E-N-O-U-R, Tom Ridenour. Tom Ridenour. He, uh, he invented this. It's a great, great system. It's Ridenour. Clarinetproducts.com. Let me get that up there. You can see that. Cool stuff. Uh, it's this. I use this all the time to adjust my reads. You know, not every read comes balanced in the box. You know, there used to be saying, "Hey, you know, if you get two reads that work in a box, you're doing great." That's not good. <laughs> so this is great for balancing your reads. But another great tool that's small and compact and great for on the go and great for all types of uh, adjustment is the Read Geek. Okay, they even make a newer version of this Read Geek Universal that's pretty cool as well. And you could pretty much do the same things on this that you can, for the most part, on this. I tend to use both. So the, for the person that asked that question, I want you to think about, you know, are your reads balanced? And um, it may not be a strength issue, it may be a balancing issue. The other thing, too, to think about, uh, if you want to know if your reads are balanced, I have some articles on my website one is um, four ways to test your reads, and there's a video there as well, a bunch of videos if I remember right. And then the other one is, uh, you know, the dreaded, you have your favorite read and it's dying on you. So I have an, an article also, How to Revive a Dead Read, and there's a video for that as well. So definitely check that out at donnaschwartzmusic.com. Head over to the blog and just scroll down and you're going to see those articles and that should definitely help you. I also have some videos under on my website under the free stuff tab. You click under woodwinds and then you'll see a bunch of things going on over there as well and that should help you with some videos and some um, information as well. And that I think are all my questions. Uh, let's see. It's okay Robert's saying it's backwards to us. You mean when I held out the written arrow thing? Yeah, you know what's weird with Facebook? It's like, um, 
I'm coming across when I play it probably looks like I'm playing wrong <laughs> um, that's the one thing I hope that they fix that because it's frustrating when you're watching this okay so it's written hour and you know what I'll do I'll put the link in once this videos up I'll put the link in the replay for the written hour and also for the uh, read gate does that work for you Robert I hope so um, I forgot about that backwards thing it's it's frustrating oh <laughs> okay so Hopefully you got a lot out of this Facebook live session. Please share it. Um, again, check out my website and check out my Facebook page, DonnaSchwartzMusic.com. Like it, come to my website, sign up. You get weekly tips. You know, uh, a lot of people say that they're getting a lot out of it and I'd like to help you too. All right, on that note, pun intended, take care. Have a great day.